advances in medicine. What are the limits? In the interview, Nobel laureate Barry Marshall. Professor Marshall, you are a physicist, a scientist, and you were granted a Nobel Prize. Mm. How did the Nobel Prize affect your scientific research? What impact did it have? Um, it freed me up to do the research that I felt like doing rather than following the agenda of one of the funding agencies, so it, that did help me. And I was able to fill in some of the weaknesses, weaknesses in my own skills by hiring uh, excellent scientists from all over the world to come to my lab. So I've enjoyed having the Nobel Prize and having uh, top quality people working for me. Did it change your personal life as well? Uh, I had to put more discipline into my life in some, some way. So instead of scheduling events, I have to schedule my time off because it's so difficult to find the, the, the rest time or the recreation time. So probably one day per week is allocated for non-academic, non-Nobel activities with my family. That's something at least, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay. What kind of a framework does research in the sciences need in order to bear fruit mm. from your point of view? What kind of conditions do we need? Uh, I think we have to have the long-term view and so many countries do have a long-term view although perhaps, perhaps not funding it adequately. Uh, I, I suppose politicians, they come and go and so they're very interested in things that just happen in one or two so like they uh, want semesters. quick results, yeah? Three years, six years. Mm. But uh, what's happened in modern times is that there's so much regulatory oversight, so much safety precautions mm. and, and registration that goes on with new products that uh, from, the, from a discovery to the implementation of a, a, a new uh, idea is far longer than it used to be. And it's, uh, the burden is on the investigators to actually carry out all these ex extra tasks that uh, surround the scientific process. Mm -hmm. And so the future, I think, is that the governments and funding agencies need to provide infrastructure to take those burdens away from the investigators and the people who are doing mm. the problem solving so that they can focus again on the science and uh, the lead time then could be shortened. Mm -hmm. Now you proved that one bacteria is responsible for most stomach ulcers. Mm -hmm. You proved that by experimenting on yourself, on your own body. Mm -hmm. Why was that necessary? So it's a good example of fast tracking the research. <laughs> yeah, <okay>. and so, <laughs> so if you like, we did have this, uh, it is a tradition uh, in medicine that uh, often new discoveries are tested out by the, uh, by the inventor. And mm -hmm. the moral situation would be... I thought this is be, a thing of the past, to be honest. Okay, but it's still going on, it's still oh, going on. But oh. the moral part of it is that if I'm going to give uh, a new product or a bacteria to a volunteer, Obviously, I should be prepared to give it to myself in the first instance, mm -hmm. and then I can say, yes, well, I know what happened. I know it's going to be uh, dangerous or not. And in those days, we had no animal models, and it's one of the very difficult things with the new bacteria or any kind of new thing in medicine is finding the correct animal model so that you can test the, the new thing out in an animal mm -hmm. and see what happens. So we did not have an animal model. So in that respect, it was a little bit dangerous, I guess, uh, diving into the unknown. But you took the bacteria yeah. and you got sick. Yeah, so I drank the bacteria and uh, I was there, fingers crossed, see what happens. After a few days, I felt a little bit unwell and that became worse and worse until I started having vomiting attacks for three days. Mm -hmm. And then the vomiting subsided. It was quite interesting, actually. My mother told me that I had a very bad breath <laughs> Halitosis. So I thought, well, <laughs> that's interesting. But I didn't uh, think about it very much until later on I realized that when you first catch the helicobacter, it can remove the acid from your stomach. Mm -hmm. And so in the initial phase, you, won't, you will not have an ulcer usually. You may have no symptoms, ah, okay. but you may have very vague things wrong I with see. you, like you feel like the food is not digesting properly or you, mm. you may have a bad breath. And uh, I think it's maybe that's one thing that I've uh, done for mankind is not quite so many people have halitosis nowadays because the helicobacter is declining. But now uh, people who have ulcers mm. can be helped mm. through your research or because of the results of your research. So it's a wonderful thing to be yeah. able to cure an illness. So in the past, if, if your doctor diagnosed that you had an ulcer, 
it was like it wasn't it was not a death sentence but it meant your the rest of your life you were going to be burdened by this continual chronic mm. illness mm. which could be quite dangerous and kill you whereas now if your doctor finds an ulcer he says oh yes but it's caused by bacteria helicobacter we can cure you in maybe one week with special antibiotics don't worry about it. So it must be a good what, feeling for you. Huh? That's right. Every patient would love to have a diagnosis yeah. which can be immediately cured and you can b go yeah. back to normal. Yeah. So you don't want a diagnosis that says, oh, mm. you're under too much stress because you can't help that. Mm. That's part of your mm. life. But still, would you say there's a limit how far medical research can go or should go? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but whether you're saying that uh, certain things should not be done because they're ethically for uh, example? Uh, uh, objectionable, like human cloning, for example. For example? Um, well, I, I would say at the moment, we don't know enough about those things to use them on humans, but of course we can clone animals now. And I would say extrapolating out, eventually we would clone humans. I don't really see that there is a, a moral objection. In my, my mind, I don't think that once the science is understood if we saw a benefit from cloning humans, I wouldn't have any objection to that. But would you really want this kind of society who can, which can do anything? Uh, well, the first thing that's going to happen, obviously, is um, genetic screening to uh, pr protect um, people from having children with a known genetic abnormality. So uh, we could say that in the next 20 years, in uh, most countries, there would be the option of getting your genome performed mm -hmm. and having an analysis of your genome by your family doctor or a confidential consultant. And then uh, if you uh, young married couples would be able to look at their ge both genomes in software and see if there are any uh, mutations which they would like to avoid. So certainly there are familial diseases. The first one, of course, would probably be cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And so at the moment, uh, that is a, a very serious disease which your children might have, which might have never been in your family. Mm -hmm. So I would say cystic fibrosis is an obvious one which you would like to test for. But isn't there also the risk of misusing science, you know? How well, can one take a this, you know? Well, there is. I, at the moment, uh, I would say that it's not a problem. It's not something that we need to worry. The restrictions that we have on science and mm -hmm. the limitations and the ethics committees, things like that, um, I don't think that they are burdening science particularly much because, of course, most of these things that we're developing, we, it's going to be so long since we, before we know all about it, yep. that before we could say that it was safe to do an experiment. Mm. Uh, obviously, um, I think already now th there are things happening. The science is actually advancing faster than the the ethical supervision and Which I saw... Which is a problem probably. Yes, well that's a problem for the scientists and I think uh, and for the society? legislation always follows the advances mm -hmm. and so uh, we, we need to watch that. Obviously there are things that have happened in the past which were very very bad for instance in the in the 70s I recall there was a one-year moratorium on genetic engineering of mm -hmm. bacteria mm -hmm. so in that one year that delayed the development of human insulin by one year mm -hmm. so how many poor diabetics might have died in that 12 months or uh, how, what was the cost uh, in the human cost in diabetics by not having human insulin available so that was one example I know at the moment there is uh, a, an unreasonable amount of concern about genetically modified foods particularly uh, here in Germany or in Europe sure. you know um, but I think that's that's a, the problem is that the uh, communication of science has failed in somewhere and the communication of non-science is very successful and one of the reasons is because uh, things that are just simple natural products even if they are useless uh, are not regulated so they don't carry the regulatory burden to be actually sold in the marketplace whereas the scientific and the drug products are regulated so much there's very difficult to actually move forward and expose people to the the science there so I think uh, certainly there needs to be more emphasis on scientific communication. The morals of science, is there a kind of moral debate also between science? How their research could be used or mit misused even? Well, I, I, I know that you know, there are examples of that in Germany and I, was, I recall that the, the, the um, uh, scientists who invented the, is it the harbour process, the, the, the manufacturing urea from mm -hmm. nitrogen for instance, 
Uh, he was also the person that uh, inv invented poison gas and bombs and things like that. Also, yeah. Alfred Nobel made most of his money out of dynamite and, of course, munitions. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I suppose there needs to be some thought about that. And uh, in my area of, say, genetic engineering, molecular biology, there is, I think the, the oversight of it at the moment is quite stringent and quite successful. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's allowed us to, to do that, of course, is the um, internet, the information uh, technology that's available. So uh, if I have anything, every, obviously every chemical, every bottle of reagents in my laboratory has got a, red, uh, a line in the, in the computer. Okay. And someone can access my computer from the university or the federal government and say, Dr. Marshall, show me what genes you are manipulating in your laboratory. Well, there's a document there mm -hmm. and we can see what they are. And of course, I can't even import the reagents into the country. I buy them uh, with special permits. So I don't have a problem with that because I know it's working so very well. So some bureaucracy is yes. good. Yes, because uh, of course, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, every government was working on war germ warfare, yeah. which these days, with the modern technology, if you worked on war germ warfare, you could certainly make something terrible just in exactly. your own laboratory. Everybody yeah. could do it. So yeah. obviously we want to regulate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, can, you could not easily start from nothing and develop um, germ warfare, warfare or molecular bi biology mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. days because you would have all kinds of signals coming out of, of mm -hmm. your operation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think these are uh, going to happen in science fiction movies, Good. but <laughs> Thank hopefully, God for that. but hopefully uh, <laughs> not in, not in real life at the moment. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for that interview. Thank, Thank you. you.